Recently, my mom's husband asked me what I eat for breakfast since I'm vegan. I told him that I eat beans, mushrooms, tomatoes, arugula, or rocket here. He told me that it was disgusting. What did he say? Well, I told him about something that he eats that's pretty much more disgusting than anything I could have for breakfast. I told him about rennet. <laughs> rennet on the off chance you're lucky enough not to know. And we don't want people to stay that lucky forever. Is the stomach lining of a calf often used to make dairy cheese? Mm, calf stomach lining. Cheese is often missed by new vegans, and new vegans often have others lamenting that they'll never be able to have cheese again. But there are some alternatives to fermented lactation. What's the best? We bring together leading vegan cheese from North America, the UK, and Europe for the first international taste test. Dea versus Redwood versus Vigusto. Fight! And I discover the science of making vegan cheese that melts and stretches. Well, does it really count if it doesn't smell like my feet and make people gag when you unwrap it in a room? With Diana Fleischman and Ian McDonald, this is The Vegan Option. Um, Brian, I'm saying um, cheese was a problem, which I haven't really found a good alternative to cheese. But other than that... I don't think we've really had that many problems. That was an auntie and her daughters from our first show, talking about what she found challenging about going vegan for a month. If you want to hear that show, following people taking the pledge, all our shows are online at theveganoption.org. And an auntie's not alone. My analysis for that show, which you can see in a blog at the same website, found out that Vegan Pledge's second biggest challenge was missing dairy, and for a large minority, that meant spontaneously mentioning cheese. Why? Usefully, Diane is an academic specializing in psychology. Which is also why this episode is late. I was in the States for a conference and to see family and friends, which left Ian at home for most of the month, doing everything for the show by himself. So what's the appeal of cheese? What I think is the most straightforward reason is that it's concentrated fat and protein, which appeals to our evolved mind. So fat, protein, and sugar were all relatively rare during human evolution, and so there's this maximal reward system built around those macronutrients. And we also feel very full when we eat fat and protein, and that's also a whole reward system in and of itself. The reward system is when your brain goes yay. This is basically it. Dr. Neil Bernard of PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, who make the scientific and medical case for veganism, pointed out in his 2003 book, The Food Seduction, that the type of protein that makes cheese stretchy, casein, breaks down during cheese production and digestion to make smaller molecules, caseomorphins that are mild opiates. So he thinks they make cheese a bit addictive. I did some research about this and... This could definitely be its own show. And quite a few people on Twitter, like Larry Zinsky, have said they'd listen to it. Exactly. So the basic premise that the cow's milk could be spiked with a chemical that's a mild opiate to reinforce the calf, to calm the calf when he is nursing, I don't have any problem with. But the idea that this casomorphin actually would cross over the blood-brain barrier and make cheese addictive to humans, I think is not that well substantiated. There's loads of animal studies about this, but for a variety of reasons, they're not very good. And as PCRM would say, a study on another animal can't necessarily be extrapolated onto humans. Exactly, especially when they are injecting animals with casomorphins, which is, doesn't in any way model how humans inge ingest them or where they use animals that have a very different protein metabolism than, than humans do. So studies have been done in babies, and babies are different than grown humans for a variety of reasons. In this case, their intestines are less selective about what kind of protein fragments can cross over into the bloodstream. So there's an idea that bovine casomorphin, which is the potentially addictive peptide in cheese, is actually getting into babies' brains. So they actually did a study with eight babies 
who had died of natural causes looking at their brainstem, and they did find casomorphins in or a marker of casomorphins in the brainstems of these babies. The other studies that we looked at looks at cheese and the kinds of opiate agonists versus opiate antagonists. Um, just because a molecule is similar to opiates doesn't mean it's going to turn on the opiate receptor. Sometimes it could clog or block it. Yes, yeah, so an opiate agonist sort of turns on the opiate response, whereas an opiate antagonist actually sort of blocks the way. What they've looked at in cheese is that in some cheeses like brie, there's more opiate agonists where it might have a more opiate effect, whereas in other cheeses like cheddar, there's more opiate antagonists. Even if there were opiate agonists in cheese, there's no evidence that it's having any effect on humans. One direct test that could be done by PCRM or anybody else interested would be to see if people who've had dairy are less pain sensitive. And for this idea, anybody out there who wants to use it, I'll take co-authorship. I did let Dr. Bernard's office know that we didn't think their references checked out in case they want us to, wanted to point us to studies we missed. We're not saying that some people don't find cheese addictive in the colloquial sense or find it hard to give up. I know I miss cheese for the first few months of being vegan. I didn't really have a problem giving up cheese. I think that I ate eggs every day before I went vegan, so I miss that quite a lot more. But I think the simplest explanation is that cheese is hard to give up because it's a fatty food. So I've replaced cheese with something else. I pretty much eat guacamole and every day. While Diana was in America, I looked at my old vegan cheese recipe from Eva Bat's Vegan Cooking. I present Diana with some vegan cheese in 1992 style. Oh my goodness. So for those of you at home, anybody who's not me and Ian, I guess, it's uh, presented here um, with a bit of tomato on a little bit of toast. The cheese itself is, um, um, it looks a bit like schmaltz, which is a, a, a <laughs> not vegan at all. It's, um, it's, a, it's a fatty um, bread covering that you get in Germany. Anyway, I'm going to take a little bite here. Oh. Mm. Um, it's very, uh, very heavy on the nutritional yeast um, and very grainy and otherwise um, doesn't really have much flavor because there's no salt in it. Well, let me try another bite. Yep, that's enough. <laughs> I think you better go and find out how to make decent vegan cheese, Ian. I did ask half a dozen different vegan cheese manufacturers. Everyone wanted to protect their trade secrets, and only one agreed to do an interview in time. Between the Swiss Alps and Lake Constance on the German border, where you might imagine yodelers and lonely cowherds, there lies Vigusto. Did you talk to a scientist there? No, they suggested I could talk to their UK representative, Mark Galvin, adding, what he does not know is secret. Wow, that was appalling, Ian. It would be okay with a little salt. It really would be. Um, we decided to use nut butter as a base, organic nut butter. Um, most of the products in the market use soy as the base. We find that nut butter gives a more natural taste and is a great base for us to use. We, use a, we have a melting cheese specifically called Melty, uh, which melts very well. It's a mixture of the different oils, the base ingredients, and the herbs and spices that are put into the product that give it its flavor. And on the melting side, it comes down to the skill of the person that formulates these products to get it to melt. Okay, but does it stretch? Our, no, our melty actually doesn't... It's, it melts, it doesn't stretch. It's a, it's a more soft cheese, actually. It's actually spreadable. You could actually get a knife, put it on, on, on a brown bread, and you could spread the cheese. Um, several vegan cheese companies have begun with people who wanted to feed their families something that looked and tasted like animal products. How did Vigusto get started? Uh, Vigusto was started 13 years ago in Switzerland by a husband and wife team. They were uh, vegans. And they found it hard to get products in Switzerland that they that, that they like. So they decided to actually make their own just for themselves. And from that, the Vagusto story started because they gave some to vegan friends they had. And it started to spread that the taste was great. And it grew from there. 
How do you think the field is going to go in the future? I believe that the vegan um, industry is moving rapidly at the moment, and I see it growing beyond everyone's expectations. Um, new products are coming on the market all the time. More and more vegetarians are turning ve- turning vegan. On a production level, on a food level, there's more science coming in. It's becoming big business. And whenever something becomes big business, you get more and more companies investing money in these small vegan companies. And it opens up a whole new realm for these companies because they've got funding. They can hire food scientists. They can uh, have their own uh, food technicians and labs. And they can create amazing products. Do you know what my favorite part of that interview was? What was your favorite part? It was an Irishman talking about Augusta Tharting 13 years ago. Right, as if you are in any position to talk about funny accents. <laughs> so maybe you should talk to a real food scientist. I got hold of Jonathan Gordon, who started off as a vegetarian chef before getting a doctorate in fermenting tofu. I went and worked for White Wave in the United States, who were the biggest tofu manufacturer which is where I really wanted to be. And while I was there, I invented silk soy milk for them, which turned into a multi-million dollar, probably now almost a billion dollar product. Uh, and that sort of set me on the, on the ground again of uh, you know, soy development work. And since then, you know, I've had my own company making soy-based cheeses, and, and now I have a consulting company where I have made soy-based cheeses for other companies. You got the guy who made silk? You weren't wasting your time completely when I was gone. Thank you. I started off by asking him what made dairy cheese different. It's a very traditional flavor that humankind has been eating for thousands of years. It's also a very, very complex flavor. So the quest for melty, stretchy, vegan cheese is by no means the whole point. The stretchiness of cheese is something that is peculiar to, to cheese products. There are, there are no other protein, protein, predominantly protein-containing products that stretch when you heat them. Uh, and that characteristic of casein uh, is something that we have been trying to replicate without the use of any animal-based products for many, many years, and only very, very recently have, have we managed to do it. Uh, I liken casein to, to an open-ended zipper, which you can uh, sort of click one step at a time, one side against the other, so that you, uh, it, you know, it, it holds, but it's a loose hold, and then it releases, and then it holds again, and so that's why, you know, you can take mozzarella on a pizza, and you can stretch it, and it'll go for a foot and a half. Uh, because of this peculiar characteristic of of casein. We have no way to do that with with any other protein. Uh, We don't have any products. I think of of tofu. You know, basically you're taking a similar kind of product. You make milk from soybeans. You grind the beans. You pour boiling water through them. You extract the fiber and you keep the milk. And you've got something that's white and you know, for re- relatively high in protein, and you coagulate it not by using a rennet or an animal-based enzyme, but by using calcium salts or magnesium salts. And when you do that, it cross-links, and that is irrevocable. Those links are not going to break, certainly not by heating them. In fact, if you heat most proteins, they tighten and contract, and, and they bond uh, closer and they force out water. You, you, you sprinkle cubed tofu on a pizza, it'll just dry out into... Exactly, yeah. The latest product that we've developed is indeed a stretching, melting cheese. Mm. And you can't tell me how you did it. I can't really tell you how I did it. Can no, you give me a clue? Proprietary. Well, uh, I can tell you that you, I have not found a way to modify proteins uh, to make them stretchy. Uh, so we had to find a way to modify carbohydrates to make them stretchy. So you'll find that vegan cheeses, for the most part, as far as I'm aware, uh, don't contain as much protein as uh, as animal-based cheeses, as dairy cheeses. Uh, they're more carbohydrate-based. Typically, they don't contain as much fat either because people are trying to avoid high levels of fat. 
Um, so the thing you have to work with is carbohydrates. So you're looking at modifying starches. We had to find a way to modify a starch as part of the process, just like you would modify casein as part of the process in cheese making, uh, so that we could cause a cheese to melt and stretch uh, and act like cheese. So the process is not dissimilar. You're using cultures or you're using enzymes to, to modify uh, carbohydrates instead of modify proteins. And, and you get a carbohydrate with this endless zipper effect. Or is that just that impossible would to be what you were aiming for, yes. That would be analogous to what you were aiming for. You have to have something, you know, that's going to, just like the casein does, uh, uh, move along itself, uh, catching and releasing and catching and releasing. How do you think the vegan cheeses are doing from the flavor perspective? Well, I think up until the last few years, pretty poorly. Um, cheese is such a complex flavor. There are so many hundreds of compounds there that provide different flavor. Uh, you, you have to sort of select just the basic few. So if you're looking for a cheddar flavor and you, you know, the, the flavor companies that provide these flavors, they'll, they'll look at what are the, the 10 most predominant flavors there and they will find a source for them through, through a chemistry or from some other natural source. So when we make a, a vegan cheese, we take a multitude of those flavors and we have to spend an awful lot of time blending them together. You know, we'll, we'll make a cheese, we'll taste it, we'll say, you know, that one just needs a hint of blue in it. So we might put a little Parmesan vegan flavor in it and uh, play around with that. And then we'll say, well, it needs a little bit more buttery note or milky note. So then we'll have to find a flavor like that. Now there's a, the, we're getting to a level of sophistication where these cheeses are tasting not bad. It's really remarkable. I, I, I remark on this all the time that you make something that looks and tastes pretty similar to cheese these days. You know, not to a, a mature three-year-old cheddar, but, but to a processed cheese when there, are n there isn't one single component in there, not a single component that you would find in real cheese. And I think that's remarkable. That was fascinating. I really like the analogy about the loose bonds, like a zipper, about how it can stretch apart as if the zipper was had holes in between. So I wonder which vegan cheese was he talking about? Who does he work for or, I mean, consult for? It's confidential. Uh, he's not allowed to say. I will be wondering about that all day. But I know what he means about it being mainly carbohydrate is true. Dea, for example, is based on tapioca flour. I wonder if the vegan companies borrow non-vegans, especially to help them with taste testing. So, which vegan cheese is best? And what do non-vegans make of them? Last year, on one of the rare sunny days we have in London, we had a garden party, and I made two pizzas. Ian put on the cheese. And in a transatlantic taste clash, I gave each pizza three cheesy rings, each of a different kind of vegan cheese. From the middle of England, Heather Mills' own Redwood Super Melting Cheesely. From the shores of Lake Constance in Switzerland, the Gusto Melty. And from the United States, Dea! USA, USA. Actually, while you were away, I got in touch with the folk who make it, and the leading American vegan cheese is actually from Vancouver, Canada. Hmm. Well, I guess Canada is really just America's hat. So when they say American, they mean Daya, which is Canadian. Sorry, Daya, they're in red, animal voices, everybody else in Canada. And we should let you know that this is a blind taste test. So what you're hearing is participants in our little survey after they found out which cheeses they were eating. Um, I don't usually use vegan cheese because um, I'm not a vegan. And I thought they were all quite disgusting, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> uh, well, I, I appreciated your systematic approach. I thought it was very admirable. But the cheese was a bit chewed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. the only one I didn't like was the cheese that was more like mozzarella. I think it was the Amer Amer mozzarella one. It was a bit more of an American style. 
but it was um, stringy kind of cheese and white. That one I didn't think was that great, but I did like the other two, which were, seemed to have stronger flavor. But I guess mozzarella, regular mozzarella doesn't have a very strong flavor. Um, I wasn't keen on the texture of that mozzarella one, but um, I quite liked the cheese that was in the middle of both pieces, in the middle of the cheeses, the Swiss one. And uh, I thought that was, had quite a nice flavor. It was pretty impressive that, you, that they, were, they were fine, they were good. Kind of really just a not really pleasant tang in, in the back of my mouth. It was all very mushy and like mashed potatoes. Uh, yeah, well, the Swiss was better than the other two, but the whole texture of it was a bit disgusting. It's obviously hard to impress them, but Will, the Canadian in the clip, and Katie, the English woman in the clip, not the royal Will and Katie, by the way, seem to think that two out of three of them weren't bad, and everybody, except for the two people who thought the cheese was disgusting, seemed to think that Vigusto was pretty good. Although, if you look at the pictures, the cheese is on pretty thick, and I'm not sure how much omnivores would like any kind of processed cheese, even if it was from a cow, heavily layered on a pizza. But... What do the vegans think of it? Well, having been a vegan for 11 years, I've never been a huge fan of vegan cheese, so I should caveat my responses with that. Um, I thought the American one, I thought the texture was interesting. It was one that sort of melted the most, um, and it was a bit stringy like traditional cheese, but it, the taste wasn't the best of the three. Um, the Swiss one, I thought the taste was, was the best of the three. Um, the texture wasn't great, and the English one, I thought, again, um, the tastes were all fairly similar, to tell you the truth, but I would say if I had to have one, it would, would have been the Swiss one. Um, um, I know the one that I really liked um, was the, it turned out to be the English one, the Redwoods. I was quite surprised how, that, how similar they all tasted, and I think the main difference with the one that I liked, which is the one that I normally buy, I found out, is that it, the texture. The American one looked stringy, it looked like cheese like pizza cheese, mozzarella cheese, but it actually tasted, the combination of the taste and the texture together just tasted a bit sickly, I thought. I use, I always use vegan cheese really sparingly, and I think generally there was a bit too much cheese on there, but obviously you wanted us to taste the cheeses, but generally I think vegan cheese is something to be used sparingly, if at all. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, there was a lot more in it than I would normally put, so I think I was tasting it in a different way than I normally do, and I think that, that did make taste less pleasant. So who won the vegan cheese competition? Well, our number one prize was to Vigusto, the Swiss cheese. Over in LA, someone who didn't layer on the cheese as thick as Ian managed to win some prize for a grilled cheese competition for their Tofutti and Dea sandwich. But then again, Ian's not well known for his culinary successes. Lee Rockingham from Redwood did point out after hearing all that that they offer a range of flavours, have lots of positive reactions and that how vegan cheeses are prepared matters. Which is definitely what our guests said. Although I have to say the base of the pizzas, one pesto and one tomato and mushroom, were delicious. Mark, who did not know that Vigusto was in a blind taste test when he agreed to the interview, listened to. Yeah, what we find actually, a lot of vegans haven't tasted cheese for so long. Now, a lot of them don't particularly want to eat cheese because they haven't had it in their diet for so long. When we go to uh, trade fairs and vegan fairs and so on, we find that that is a small percentage of the vegan community. Uh, what we find is especially the younger vegans and new vegans um, are so happy to find a cheese that they like that we get amazing responses. And I'm going to square with you here. I'm the vegans in that group are pretty long-term vegans. Yes, that's what we find. You're quite confident that in the future, uh, with more food science involvement, that there's going to be vastly more take-up of analogues. Does the negative reaction that all the vegan cheese got from most of the omnivores shake your confidence that we are going to move in that direction? Not at all, because I know for a fact that these um, a 
amazing vegan companies that are out there, not just the Gusto, the Redwoods, the Dea, the um, the She's, and so on, will all improve over the next few years. And there'll be new kids on the block as well, many, many more. And I think we're... The dairy, actually, I think dairy alternatives are a bit harder, especially cheese is probably the hardest product uh, to replace, whereas I think the meat alternatives are are getting so good that within a few years, I think people will actually prefer them to meat. I liked all the vegan cheeses being tasted, so to me the reaction was a bit of a shock. And I really like Dea and Vagusto, so I was a bit surprised as well. But speaking of new kids on the block, like Mark was talking about, When I was in the United States, I tried the new Dea cheese wedge with my mother and my stepdad, who generally are not big fans of vegan cheese. We tried it straight out of the package, and we all thought it was really tasty. I thought it was delicious. However, the advice that's commonly given, like Bob and Jenna, the vegan freaks, have given, is that if you're newly vegan, if you've just been eating cow's cheese, vegan cheese might not taste exactly right. You should leave a few months between. And I've actually had the same experience with cow's cheese tasting weird after being vegan for a long time. We've said before that Diana's a lot less strict than me and lapses into freeganism um, occasionally. And one time was stuck on a long fright where you, they bought, brought you macaroni and cheese as the vegan option. Yeah, so everybody was given pizza. I thought I was going to be given something without cheese. They came by and they brought me something mac and cheese absolutely layered with cheese. Now, after I figured, filled out a complaint and I talked to the flight attendant, who was very sorry, she said, look, we're going to throw all the food away at the end of the flight, which is what they always do on airplanes. And what do you think? And I said, uh, maybe I'll try and eat it because I'm very hungry. And I was very hungry and I had a couple of bites and it was really, really disgusting. Much worse than any of the vegan cheeses, I think, on our pizza. Including the one I made? Yes. <laughs> Follow us and tweet us at Vegan Option on Twitter. We'd like to hear from you, like Krista, who tweeted that. I've listened to all the episodes that were available on iTunes. Looking forward to more in the future. I hope you enjoyed this, Krista. You can like us and comment at facebook.com slash vegan option and see the pizza pictures or leave us a comment at theveganoption.org. Rob Masters wrote the music. I'm Diana Fleischman. Not doing very much this month other than looking up stuff about KC and Amorphans. And I'm Ian McDonald, reporting and producing. This July, the world's athletes come to where we live in the east end of London. Subscribe so you don't miss the vegans who are part of the London Olympic Games.